Well, welcome to lecture nine in social neuroscience. And today we're going to be talking about brain development. <clears throat> now, um, before I actually start talking about brain development, I just want to go ahead and just do a quick review of psychological development. And this is because most of the stuff that we could be talking about about development is very well covered by other courses if you're a psychology student. And in fact, Sapolsky does a really good job of summing up some of the major things you should know about psychological development. So I'm just going to refer you to, to Sapolsky's chapter for other stuff that I'm not covering today. So for example, he does cover Piaget's stages of cognitive development, Kohlberg's stages of moral development, he talks about research about parenting and specifically how parenting might differ by different cultures, the effects of friends or peers on social development, and finally, culture. Now, all of these are important topics, and so um, if I had more time, of course, I would cover them. But again, today I'm just going to be focusing more on brain development itself. Um, there is one last section of Chapter 7 in Sapolsky's book about sex in the brain that I'll be covering in the next lecture. All right, so for brain development, so what we're going to talk about first, we're going to talk about prenatal development. Then we're going to cover five processes in the development of neurons. We'll talk about the roles of experience in the environment. And specifically, we'll be looking a little bit more at behaviorism and then attachment theory. And then finally, the last part of the lecture, probably the most depressing part of the lecture, is the vulnerable developing brain. We're going to look at how stress and childhood poverty affect uh, the developing brain, stress and childhood adversity more generally, diet and pollution can all affect your developing brain. So let's look at development of the brain all the way back to the fetus. And specifically, um, we're going to look at what happens around day 18, where you have a neural plate that's formed. And now the neural plate is because around this time, uh, when the CNS begins to form, you actually have three layers in the embryo, three cell layers. And then one layer is called the ectoderm. This is where um, skin and neural tissues will eventually arise. We have the mesoderm, where muscle and bone arise. And then finally, the endoderm, where digestive and respiratory tracts um, will develop from. So in this drawing, you can see in pink, we have the um, ectoderm. And this is where originally it's called the neural plate. But between days 18 and day 22, things sort of wrap around. We get this thing called the neural tube. And the neural tube is basically where all of the brain and spinal cord uh, development is going to occur. There's a nice example of this here where you can kind of see the neural tube in terms of its three main parts called the proencephalon, the mesencephalon, and the rhomboencephalon. And then there's secondary divisions for each of them. And then finally, you can see what's going to happen in terms of where these go. Um, and for instance, the proencephalon is going to become um, the cerebral cortices, the caudate, the putamen the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and all that comes from the proencephalon. Now, you don't need to know these terms, proencephalon, mesencephalon, and so on, but I just wanted to show you that very early on, that neural tube is already starting to segment, segment and then as it segments, it's going to continue to subdivide and create those final segments that we have in the adult brain. So in prenatal development, you can see this nice drawing here kind of showing what happens from 3 weeks, 7 weeks, 11 weeks, and so on. Um, by seven weeks, the hindbrain, the midbrain, and the forebrain are well differentiated. So it's easy to see in um, any kind of observation of a fetal brain. Um, at birth, amazingly, um, the brain weighs 350 grams. But at about nine months after birth, the prefrontal cortex has already developed enough for the child to achieve object permanence. And then finally, at the end of the first year, the brain weighs about 1,000 grams, which is relatively close to what the adult weight of the brain is, which is between usually 1,200 and 1,400 grams. So a lot is happening from uh, conception all the way up to that end of that first year in terms of brain development. Now, a lot of what's happening besides this organization into these different segments of the brain is we have just neuron growth happening exponentially. It's really happening quickly, and there's lots of things happening in terms of where the neurons are going and so on. So I wanted to go ahead and just review with you five processes in the development of neurons. And some of these we've referred to in earlier lectures, and now we can kind of really talk about them in a little bit more detail. Um, proliferation is one of these processes. So this is the production of new cells. Proliferation happens a lot in the prenatal brain. The neurons are developing in one of the four ventricles in the brain or in the spinal col column. 
In humans, by the fifth month of pregnancy, they are already peaking in that fetus at around 250,000 new neurons a minute. So that's a lot of neuron growth happening, 250,000 new neurons a minute. And then after they um, you know, cr are created, there's division, and some of them will stay on as stem cells, and that means that they will have the ability to create more neurons, and others will become daughter cells that go off to new destinations in the brain and basically start to form these different structures in the brain. So that's proliferation, the one process of just producing all these new cells that happens at a great amount of um, a great pace in these early months. Then we have another process which is called migration and aggregation. And as we said, these daughter cells start to move elsewhere. And these primitive daughter cells are called neuroblasts. In the brain, they move along what are called radial glia, which is um, glia are like these supporting um, uh, uh, compounds that are helping the, the neurons develop and move. And they basically form sort of like a scaffolding where the um, neuroblasts can move along to the place where they need to be positioned, where they need to go. So there's all of this migration happening as the neurons are created and then they kind of be move, they're moved into the right place along this sort of brain scaffolding of the radial glia. Um, you can find lots of images or videos of, uh, of this if you want. Uh, here's just an example, for instance, of migration and action of the rat embryo. embryo. And you can see here, here's a single cell that's moving along some of these glia, sta the sca glia scaffolding. And you can see the time down there of 20 hours, 24 hours, and so on. And as the, as the time passes in this developing rat embryo, you can see how that neuron has just moved from one place to another in the brain in just a matter of a few days. All right, so the same thing's happening in all sorts of mammal brains, including human brains during development. So that's obviously a very important process. The third process I wanted to bring up here is what's called differentiation. So originally when these neuroblasts are formed, these daughter cells, and they get to their location, you don't have the dendrites and the axons just yet. So what's going to happen here is in this stage or in this phase, we have axons and dendrites taking on their shape. Now the axons really start first. They're actually the ones that grow before the dendrites. So you can see in this picture, um, the, de the axon came first, and then after the axon was kind of fully out where it was gonna go and it branched, then the dendrites start to branch and create all of their um, little um, branches. How does the axon know where to go? Because you remember the axons are the ones that are probably stretching and moving along the farthest. Well, these axons seek specific connections. And we've known about this for almost 100 years now. For instance, Weiss back in 1924 took axons from a normal leg and branched it to, uh, found that these axons would branch to corresponding muscles of a grafted leg. So you could take a, um, of a leg from an animal and take some neurons and put it to another um, leg and you could find that the axons would actually know where to go. They could actually somehow sense where they needed to connect to this new leg that was being attached to the animal's body. Sperry back in 1943 cut axons from the optic nerve to the tectum and then rotated the eye of the newt. So he took the newt, cut the axons from the optic nerve to the tectum, turned the eyeball upside down, put it back in, and in, the, in that way that the eye was now turned, the newt would still live, everything was good, but what happened was the axons that had been cut and then sort of rebuilt themselves returned to their original site. And now what happened was that the newt would actually see the world upside down and backwards. So it wasn't like the axons went to the right part of the, the eye there, they just kind of went to their site where they were used to be connected to, and so now you found that the newt saw the world upside down. So basically what's going on in, in terms of this um, axon growth is that the axons are following chemical gradients. Um, so for example, in the newt, protein is more concentrated more in the dorsal than the ventral retina, and it's more in the ventral than the dorsal tectum. So axons from the retina follow paths to sites on the tectum that have similar protein concentrations. So they, they know where to go based on where these protein concentrations are, and that's how they know how to make their connections. And you can kind of see this in a picture of a newt's head where it's kind of showing you here that the retinal axons match up with neurons in the tectum by following these two different gradients. The protein is concentrated mostly in the dorsal retina and the ventral tectum. Axons rich in that protein attached to the tectal neurons that are also rich in that chemical. Similarly, a second protein directs axons from the posterior retina to the rostral portion of the tectum. So 
This is just trying to show you that you don't really have to understand the basic physics or chemistry of how this is all happening. It's just so you can understand that these axons know where they need to go based on differences in chemical uh, gradients. All right, so we have two final processes to mention, and these two are things that we covered in the lecture on adolescence. Um, one of them is myelination. So myelination is that addition of this insulating sheet that speeds up transmission. And you remember, this happens actually all the way up to the age of 25. We talked about it during adolescence because that happens at a very great rate during that um, adolescence, but it's also happening pretty quickly in this, this first year or two of life. And then the other thing that happens, another important process is what's called synaptogenesis, where we get the formation of the synapses, you know, these connections between those axon terminals and their dendrites. And so this is gonna continue throughout life. It's not something that just ends um, at any particular age. We're always having um, synaptogenesis going on. Now, one thing that's really curious about the way the brain creates its neurons is that we actually do produce more neurons than we need and this is probably to be sure that there are enough for each receiving cell. So it might be that the brain um, by default just creates more neurons because in, in case uh, there's a shortage at some particular location, we don't wanna have that happen. So there's just like this overproduction of neurons. And so the neurons have to survive, right? So they're gonna be, some of them are gonna survive and some of them are not gonna survive. So how do we know which neurons are gonna stick around, which ones are gonna be uh, die. Well, their survival requires two conditions. One is that they must form a synapse with whatever their target cell is and receive a nerve growth factor, uh, a neurotropin it's called, which is a type of protein, from that cell. So as the neuron makes a synapse with another neuron, and the dendrites of that neuron, that second receiving neuron will actually send out this nerve growth factor that will tell that um, that basically gives the signal to that cell that it's made contact or it's made a, a proper synaptic connection. And so that's a necessary requirement is that neurons must make these synapses. They also must be sim stimulated to release the neurotransmitters into the synapse. So if, you know, they might go ahead and done their thing where the axon has gone to a, the right location to make a possible synapse with a um, some dendrites of a receiving neuron, if it can't release any neurotransmitters into that synapse, it's not necessary. We don't need that particular neuron. So what happens is, without those two conditions being met, you get what's called aptotosis, which is programmed cell death that occurs when the synapses receive little nerve growth factor and other neurotropins that basically are signaling to that neuron, we don't need you, right? So if um, we're not getting any signs from a receiving neuron that uh, we've we've been receiving neurotransmitters or that we're getting um, the synapse to be built. Um, basically, that neuron knows then, yeah, let's say knows, but it's getting feedback that it doesn't, it's not necessary, and so it's gonna be programmed to die. And then, the, as I mentioned in a previous lecture, when that happens, um, the neuron's um, pieces of bits are gonna actually be recycled and used elsewhere. This competition among neurons for survival is a selection process that's been termed neural Darwinism. And it's really quite interesting in terms of um, you know, which neurons are gonna make it and which ones are not. A lot of this is probably sh being shaped by what's going on in the person or the animal's environment, the experiences that they're having, um, what kinds of stimulation, what kinds of um, other factors are affecting that brain as, as it's developing. So that moves us to the roles of experience and the environment which is the next big topic I wanted to cover. Now, you might remember that back in the first lecture, I did talk about this guy, John Broadus Watson, who was this psychologist who was really famous in the early part of the 20th century for his um, you know, uh, promotion of behaviorism. And he did publish this book in 1924 that I mentioned, where he said, give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed to my own specified world to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee that I can make any one of them anything I want, right? A doctor, lawyer, merchant chief, and yes, even beggar man and thief. So you remember that this was a very strong environmentalist position that he was trying to say is that there's something about the environment that we can manipulate and that's completely determines what happens to that infant's development. And then he went on to write a book of parenting called Psychological Care of the Infant and Child with His Wife. And in 1928, this uh, book had all sorts of um, suggestions about the proper care for children. But because at that time, the um, approach of behaviorists in psychology and 
particularly Watson's flavor of behaviorism, focused on external events. It was mainly a book recommending how adults or parents should manipulate the environment of their infant so that the child will grow up um, correctly and have the best experience. And so you might remember I told you that there was even tips about how loud the sounds are around there so it doesn't create inappropriate fear reactions, that there should be loose enough clothing on so you don't um, cause unnecessary range, rage from having a child that's bundled too tightly. And you remember too that he said that children should never be stimulated into love responses when they um, when they ought to be developing self-reliant behavior. And he said nothing made him um, draw a scorn more than anything than the coddling of children, which he saw was the ineffective uh, an effective reward um, by giving child's, children hugs and kisses. He said, when I hear a mother say, bless its heart when it falls down or stubs its toe or suffers some other ill will, I usually have to walk a block or two off to let off steam. Never hug and kiss them, he said. Never let them sit on your lap. If you must, kiss them once on the forehead when they say goodnight. Shake hands with them in the morning. Give them a pat on the head if they've made an extraordinarily good job of a difficult task. Now, why was he saying all that? I mean, it just sounds like he's being so severe. But he strongly had these notions about emotions, and specifically love, that he thought that love can't be confusing. It needs to be um, given in a particular way um, at only particular times. And if you go ahead and give them too much love, and, you, and, this, and by the way, love is just a type of kind of reinforcement, right? So you're going to go ahead and give them these things that make them feel love. That's actually just going to confuse their development. So it was a really sort of very manipulative idea for how you were supposed to raise your children. Now, Watson did fall out of favor in academia. He ended up having a scandal when he um, got into an affair with this woman that he ended up marrying. But after um, uh, Watson, we do have that continuation of behaviorism with B.F. Skinner. Now, Skinner never took such an extreme position like Watson in terms of writing a book and telling people that you shouldn't give any love to your children. But he still, and he and the other behaviorists, I should say, still believed that it was all about reinforcement and the environment and whether or not you got positively reinforced that will increase your behavior. Um, and so he really emphasized for the rearing of children that it had to do with reinforcements. Okay. And so something like love and affection wasn't really something you could easily quantify. So it would be more about the fact that a parent is a good parent when they give their child um, food, they give them warmth, they give them safety, that kind of stuff would be um, more important, I guess, for reinforcement. Now that position that Skinner took in the 40s and 50s, though, was countered by other people. There were other psychologists who did not agree with Skinner and the behaviorists, and one of those people was Harry Harlow. Now Harlow is talked about in Sapolsky's book. Now Har Harlow did most of his research with rhesus monkeys at the University of Wisconsin in the United States um, in the 1950s and 60s. A lot of what he did with these monkeys we would consider today to be unethical, unethical treatment of animals, um, and you couldn't do this kind of research now. But in 1958, interestingly, he gave an address to the American Psychological Association called The Nature of Love. And in this paper, he was arguing against the behaviorists. He said, if it was really just about nourishment or that um, parents you know, provide their um, child food and shelter, and that's all that mattered, how could you explain this? That when you have a, a little rhesus monkey here that has a choice between a, um, a wired mother, you can see on the left there, that gives it nourishment, gives it its milk. And then you have another mother right next to it there. You can see it looks like a mother. Um, and it's, um, it's all cuddly and cozy. And it's a place where the animal can cling to it and feel connected. Um, why is it then that that infant monkey spends a way much more time on the cloth surrogate mother than it does with that wired monkey, even though the wired monkey is where it's getting its food? And so that question that he posed in his talk was that he said that there must be something really fundamental about parenting that when you have a child or a baby rhesus monkey, um, that it needs to have love, it needs to have cuddling, it needs to have touch from its parent. So this really started to make people question the whole behaviorist approach to parenting. But another important person that comes along around this time is John Bowlby. John Bowlby was a British psychologist, psychiatrist, and a psychoanalyst. 
And he had done work for many decades、um, looking at what happened to children who didn't have the, the best、um, uh, developmental histories.、Um, for instance, back in the 40s and 50s, shortly, I think it actually started during World War II, Bowlby was really interested in understanding juvenile delinquents in, in London. And what he discovered is that most of the juvenile delinquents that he interviewed and studied had prolonged separation from their primary caregiver before the age of five. And so I think a prolonged、um, uh, Uh, separation was something like six to eight months. Something had happened where they had an interrupted、um, caregiving from their primary caregiver that had happened before the age of five. He later extended this thinking to families that were intact, but perhaps where the children didn't really attach to their parents. That is, maybe you were never really separated from your primary caregiver, but there's something about your relationship with your parent where you don't have like a A bond or attachment or connection between you and that parent. And so that research that he did for a couple decades, looking at juvenile delinquency and other problems among adolescents, led to his formulation of attachment theory that he published in three large volumes in 1969, 1972, and 1980. Now, a lot of this work on attachment theory came about,、uh, came about from working with one of his colleagues on what's called the stranger. I'm、uh, sorry, the strange situation task. And in the strange situation task, what you would do is you would put your infant、um, or your toddler in a position where the mother might be there,、uh, or the, it's usually the mother. The mother would be there with the infant or the toddler, and then suddenly the mother would get up and leave, and then the mother would come back, and the mother would leave, the mother would come back. And in that interaction, as the mother keeps leaving and coming back, They go ahead and the observers, the people running the, the study, would actually pay attention to how the, the、um, toddler, the child, the baby would act. And what they ended up coming up with was a classification system for different kinds of children. One was what they called an, a secure attachment pattern. And basically, this was characterized by、um, children where I, they, their responses were when the caregiving was available. I'm sorry, it's, it's a kind of response、uh, that you have when caregiving is available and, and the caregiver is meeting their needs. So basically, a secure attachment basically means that the child doesn't panic when the caregiver leaves the room because like, their needs are currently being met. They're happy to see them when they come back and they continue to play. And then the mother leaves again, they're just fine with it. Because what basically this means is that if you have a secure attachment with that primary caregiver, you know that you're You can depend on them. The caregiver is going to be around when you need them. And not only that, they actually meet their, your needs. So they call that a secure response pattern. Then they had what they called an anxious ambivalent pattern. This was basically a pattern where the child would get quite、um, sort of upset when the mother would leave. But then when the mother would come back, the child would act sort of ambivalent, not really care that the mother was back. And so they considered this kind of attachment、uh, style to be a response to an unpredictable caregiving. Um, from the primary caregiver. Then there was ambivalent avoidant, which was what they said was、um, a, basically a response to constant rejection. So this child is just never cares whether or not the parent is there. They're just basically always sort of upset when the parent's not around, but they don't care when the parent comes back either. And this, they think, had to do with、uh, maybe a pattern of behavior between that child and their caregiver in which the Uh, caregiver just didn't, was rejecting them whenever the child needed something. And so that meant that, that this child、uh, just didn't really want to depend on that caregiver anymore. And finally, there's a fourth type of attachment that they talked about in later years.、Um, this is what was called a disorganized attachment. The children who had a disorganized attachment had really stressful like, looking responses. They would shake, they would be quite upset. And、um, it would just happen the entire time that they were being tested, basically. This is sort of like a category that didn't fit really well with the other three types of attachments. So it was sort of like a mixed category of responses. But later, as they did the research, they found that most of the mothers of these children had suffered major losses or other trauma shortly before. Or after the birth of the infant. So maybe like there had been a murder that had taken place, or there was a really bad accident. And so the mother had reacted by becoming severely depressed due to that trauma. And that seemed to be what characterized most of the、uh, mothers of these kids that were disorganized. All right, so I know you've run into attachment theory before, but it's important just so you know what the basics are so we can talk about it a little bit more here.、Um, it has 
found and been found to continue on into adulthood. Um, Hazan and Shaver in 1987 were the first to actually look this in this in adults. They called it secure, anxious, ambivalent, and avoidant. And I'll show you what their items would be like for that particular uh, adult attachment. And then Bartholomew and Horowitz also um, looked at this. They talked about what they called the working model of the other and whether you could trust them or whether it was negative, and then the working model of the self, whether you think of yourself as being worthy or, um, or negative. Um, and then the combination of those two working models would determine what your attachment style was. This Bartholomew and Horowitz, by the way, fits better with the way that Bowlby originally talked about it. So Bowlby thought of those different kinds of attachment patterns as being working models or mental models about how that child thinks of their relationship with their caregiver. So they're sort of developing from experience, from history, you know, every time there's an interaction between that child and their caregiver, there's like new data coming in to kind of update what that model is. And so the four different kinds of attachment patterns that I mentioned there would be a result of the different working models that have been created by their experiences with their primary caregiver. Now let's just look at these adult attachment styles for just for a second. So Hazan and Shaver have done a lot of research, like I said, looking at this with adults. Um, so they have these three kinds of attachment styles, secure, avoidant, and anxious. So a person who has like a secure attachment style would say among about their relationships now, like their close relationships, like a boyfriend or a girlfriend, I find it relatively easy to get close to others. I'm comfortable depending on them and having them depend on me. I don't often worry about being abandoned or about someone getting too close to me. So you can see that kind of seems similar to what you saw in the uh, stranger situation task. Um, and avoidant would be, I am somewhat uncomfortable with being close to others. I find it difficult to allow myself to depend on them. I am nervous when anyone gets too close and often love partners want to me to be more intimate than I feel comfortable being. And then finally we have the anxious, which is that I find that others are reluctant to get as close as I would like. I often worry that my partner doesn't really love me or won't want to stay with me. I want to merge completely with another person and this desire sometimes scares people away. So Hazan and Shaver actually came up with a questionnaire that you can complete and then it tells you based on your scores which of those bins best, you know, best um, fits your pattern. Now I've given these kinds of questionnaires to my students in other classes before. I actually gave this one um, to um, one of my first year statistics courses. And just to give you an idea of the frequency of these kinds of things in the adult population, you can see that um, of the 210, 50 or whatever students I had in this particular course, you can see that the majority of them are actually have the secure attachment style. So 102 um, actually pick that as their um, best describing of their um, attachment for their adult relationships. But you can see that avoidant was close on its heels, 95 people for avoidant, and then 42 was anxious. So that was less um, often, but we did get people in our sample who had 42, 42 of them had that anxious attachment style. So this is sort of a categorical approach, I call it, because what you're doing is you're just putting people sort of like in each of those three different bins or categories, much like the way um, they would have done back in uh, Bowlby's time with his research, where they would go ahead and test these infants and then uh, put them in those different attachment styles. There's also this other approach that I mentioned which has to do with more about your mental working models of yourself and other. Um, and this is more of a dimensional approach. So the idea here is that you can actually have scores on a couple different dimensions, whether you're high or low in avoidance and whether you have high or low anxiety about your particular partner. And you can see that if you have low anxiety and low avoidance, you'd have basically like a secure attachment style. But if you have low avoidance but high anxiety, then you become preoccupied, that's your attachment style. High avoidance, high anxiety is a fearful avoidant. And then finally we have a dismissing avoidant, which would be low anxiety, high avoidance. So this is another sort of approach is to use a dimensional approach, again, with questionnaires that you could um, complete and then find out if your participants fit where they fit on this particular um, set of axes. Now, the why I brought all this up is because the researchers who looked at adult attachment styles have in their heads, when they originally started doing this work back in the 80s, they thought, well, is any of this related to what they were like when they were kids? Like if you had tested them in the stranger situation test, are they like this when they become adults? And there is lots of evidence now, longitudinal research that shows that if you do test somebody well into their adult years, that pretty much the same sort of working model that you develop 
about your primary caregiver becomes the working model you have about any other close relationship. So if you basically have a secure attachment style with your primary caregiver, then as an adult, you'll have a secure attachment style pretty much with your close relationships as an adult. So this is a nice connection. It kind of shows that it seems to kind of fit the whatever your experiences are. Um, they're going to kind of stay with them, uh, stay with those working models. But please keep in mind that the idea between both um, Bowlby and even these modern researchers now who've been looking at adult attachment style is that your working model is constantly being updated. So a working model means that, you know, this is a pretty good model that works for most of the time to help me understand what I'm going to expect in close relationships. But you could have experiences that could change you from having, like, for instance, a secure attachment style to being more a fearful avoidant. Or maybe you finally overcome the fearful avoidant and become more secure. Um, things do change. And so you don't get like a 100% correlation here between what goes on in early life and, and what happens with adults. But that said, here's an interesting study that was published in 2022, February of 2022. It's, um, basically what it shows is that early attachment does predict behavior and neural responses to cues of trustworthiness at adolescence. So this is a longitudinal study where they're able to study the same kids from when they were first tested on the stranger situation task to, I'm sorry, the strange situation task until they get tested in an fMRI scanner. So what they did is they looked at 52 US children tested at 33 months of age in the strange situation procedure. So they did sort of a classic version of the strange situation procedure. Um, there were some changes they made from the way it was originally proposed back in the 60s, but they used that and tested all those kids when they were 33 months of age. And then 10 years later, they recruited them to participate in a study. Now they're around 13 years of age, so they're in their adolescence, all right? So back at 33 months, what did they find? Well, the strange situation procedure yielded four types of um, secure insecure attachment styles. Now you'll notice that the names for these categories is a bit different from the way Bowlby talked about them, or even the way that some of those adult attachment researchers uh, use them. So there's always this sort of evolving thing going on in the attachment literature. And if you really want to be up to date on it, you want to go and look at some of the most recent research on it. They have come up with different nuanced names for some of these attachments. But here we go. We have 33 secure toddlers. That turns out to be the most common group was that they had 33 out of those 52 kids tested were um, secure. They had two that had what they called insecure avoidant. You had eight that had insecure ambivalent. And finally, they had nine that were insecure other. And this might be as close to like the disorganized stage. But what they ended up doing, because they got so few people coming back 10 years later from those insecure groups, they went ahead and just put those groups together and called them the insecure group. So you can see we have 19 then of these adolescents had insecure patterns, although the patterns were a little bit different. And the reason why they had to do that is because they needed enough power. They needed to have large enough groups here to make comparisons. So they just went ahead and compared the secure to the insecure um, toddler sample. Okay. So now here they are at 13 on average, and they're coming to the fMRI scanner. And what do they do? Well, in the scanner, they're gonna view 28 faces, one at a time, and each picture is gonna be presented to them. And the picture indicate is that sh is shown to them is something that varies in terms of how untrustworthy to trustworthy the picture looks. So these are actually the some of the pictures. It comes from the Karolinska um, stimulus set. So Karolinska is in Sweden, and they created this stimulus set, I think of Swedes, um, who just look at the camera like you see there in this picture. And then what happened was, years later, others showed these same pictures and had participants rate how trustworthy the person looked. Okay, Some people look like you could just run up to them and hug them and trust them completely. Other people look kind of sketchy, look untrustworthy, all right? And there's really good consensus about these pictures. You can find that you can show them to different samples of people and people pretty much agree that this guy looks more trustworthy, this guy looks more untrustworthy, and the same for the female faces. All right, so keep that in mind. So they have like this nice um, standardized stimulus set, much like we talked about in a previous lecture about the International Affective Picture System that's been normed on hundreds and hundreds of people who have made the ratings of those pictures. Same thing here. People have rated these pictures and then we have really good norms about whether the picture is somebody who's trustworthy or untrustworthy.
Now in the scanner, they had um, these regions of interest and you can see them identified here in the picture from the article. That is, um, they were mainly looking at the amygdala, the right anterior insula, the right superior, sempral, superior temporal sulcus and the fusiform gyrus. So all parts of the social brain and specifically there's parts of the social brain that in other research have been found to be sensitive to perceptions of trustworthiness when adults look at pictures of faces like this. So when other, in other studies, people have shown them the Carol, the uh, researchers have shown these Karolinska um, photos, and we found that those are the areas that tend to be sensitive to how trustworthy or untrustworthy the picture actually is. All right, so now we have a basic understanding of what the study is. Let's look at what they found. Now their main finding here, remember they're all adolescents, all of our participants now, and they could be divided into those who are insecure versus those who are secure. And what they found was that those with an insecure attachment from 33 months of age were more likely to rate the less trustworthy faces as actually trustworthy. And they showed less activation in their regions of interest, those particular areas that I talked about, when they looked at less trustworthy faces. Now you can see this by looking at the picture on the left, figure two. This is just their ratings of trustworthiness. So the participant rates how trustworthy the face looks. And now at the bottom on the x-axis, you can see what's called consensus ratings of the facial stimuli. That has to do with those normed ratings that hundreds of other participants have given, right? So some of these photos were already had been rated as more trustworthy, somewhere in the middle, somewhere in the less trustworthy range. And you can see that this line here, this like regression line is showing you that when the photo is more trustworthy, the two groups, insecure and secure, have no significant difference. That's what that n dot s dot means, no significant difference in how they rated, how trustworthy they were. They basically, they see a trustworthy face, both insecure and secure say, yeah, that looks like a trustworthy face. Where they differed were those pictures where the um, face was less trustworthy. And so there you can see that secure people really do rate that less trustworthy face as less trustworthy. Whereas the insecure um, attachment people, they're actually giving them higher ratings for trustworthiness. They don't seem to be as deeply affected by how untrustworthy the face looks. Over on the right, you can see the activation across those regions of interest. So they just grouped them across all of them, the amygdala and the STS and so on. And you can see that you get that same sort of pattern for the most trustworthy pictures. There's no difference for insecure and secure participants when they look at the most trustworthy photos. The difference really lies in the ones that are less trustworthy. And specifically, you can see that when secure people look at untrustworthy faces, those areas like the amygdala, the anterior insula, and so on, become more activated. It's like they're scanning the face, looking for them to see if you can trust them. The insecure people are not doing that. The insecure attachment people show less of scanning of those faces for the less trustworthy faces. So they're not really showing much activation there. Um, and so therefore we can kind of say they're almost like shutting it off or insecure, uh, you know, just not using it to process whether or not the face is less trustworthy. So that's really interesting. It maybe shows then that there's some sort of long-term effects of whatever their mental working models were of attachment with their primary caregiver back when they were tested at 333 months of age to now when they're looking at faces out in the world and how it affects whether or not they see them as trustworthy or not. All right, so that's a nice current study, uh, a very recent study that's looked at this relationship of attachment and trustworthiness. Now, the final topic that I wanna cover here, like I said before, is sort of our most uh, depressing topic, which is um, I wanna talk about the vulnerable developing brain. Now, we're gonna find that the developing brain is more vulnerable than at any other time to the effects of things like malnutrition, toxic chemicals, infections, and so on. A lot of this is covered in Sapolsky's book as well, but I wanna go ahead and highlight a few things that he talks about as well as some other things he didn't talk about. So first of all, we should just say right off the top that stress affects the vulnerable developing brain, just like it does in a full adult brain. This is uh, from an article that was published in 2009. It's a nice review paper, and I'm actually gonna make this available on our Blackboard page, so if you want to look at this article later, you can, but it's looking at the effects of stress across the lifespan, okay? And what they're trying to show you here is that we can look at prenatal stress, you know, before you were born, then postnatal stress in those first few years of life, we can look at stress in adolescence, 
stress in adulthood and stress in aging. And they're specifically looking at the effect of um, what's going on on the HPA axis. And you can see that what's happening a lot is during prenatal stress, basically the HPA axis is helping program the effects. So we're basically getting all that neural development and, and uh, differentiation so that we can make the right kind of connections. And then when we get to birth, what's happening is the HPA axis is starting to distinguish between different kinds of stressors, okay? There's lots of different kinds of stressors we could have out there, and I went through this a little bit on that lecture about hormones, that we have this um, anterior pituitary that's gonna release the um, hormones that are gonna cause uh, glucocorticoids to be released eventually at the adrenal gland, and they're actually sensitive, the, um, the anterior pituitary, to lots of different kinds of inputs because there's lots of different kinds of stress. And we can see, for instance, that maternal separation, if you have for some reason, like the way Bully found that those juvenile delinquents had some sort of separation from their parent for eight or nine months, that you're going to get an increase of glucocorticoids. You're going to have this increased stress during that time. Interestingly, if you have some sort of severe trauma that happens during this period of time, glucocord production goes down. And therefore, because of that, you're not going to have the same sort of abilities to adapt to stress. Then you can see that in stress in adolescence, we get similar kinds of things that happen for different kinds of things, although it's much more so in adolescence and so on across the lifespan. So I guess I want to just make sure you understand that this relationship between our hormones and our brain development is happening all the time across the entire lifespan, all the way up until old age. Um, and that stress is going to be a really important factor in understanding what's going on in terms of the developing brain and the endocrine system. Keep in mind that Sapolsky has done most of his uh, career, it, most of his career's research has been about stress. And so he talks a lot about this in that chapter because he finds that stress is such a fundamental, important part about social development. Well, there's some other things that we can talk about specifically about stress. And one thing I wanted to talk about here is socioeconomic status. So socioeconomic status turns out to be a major source of stress. That is people who are in low SES families, low socioeconomic status families, people who are in poorer families, experience increased stress related to things like social rank. So just this is something that you find that monkeys are sensitive to and humans are sensitive to. So if you're in a, uh, a class or a caste of people that are normally going to be dumped upon um, for all sorts of different reasons, that causes you to be more stressful than the more privileged groups in your society. It's also going to mean that you're going to have more difficulties in providing for your family's needs. That's a lot of stress. And living in dangerous neighborhoods is stressful and lots of other factors, right? So lots of stress associated with being in low SES. But what's, why I'm bringing this up here is that this kind of SES stress does not only affect the adults, it affects the child. By five years old, it's already been shown in much research now, the lower your SES, the higher your glucocord levels are. So we find that, um, that just increased stress from being in low SES means that you overall have higher glucocorticoid levels, higher cortisol levels, and other stress hormones that you have a thinner frontal cortex, perhaps, perhaps because of that increased uh, glucocorticoid activity. You also have poor frontal lobe functioning um, by five years old if you have lower SES. And remember how much in frontal lobes are gonna be important for emotional regulation, focus, attention, all sorts of other things that keep happening all the way up through adolescence. And then we also get more impairment of corpus callosum maturation. So just by the bad luck, of being somebody who's born into a low SES family or a low SES situation means that already by the age of five, we got all these differences, right? So there's already much um, significant difference between people of lower SES on these um, biological measures. Now, that's one kind of stress, just being from low SES or the effects of SES. Um, you can also just look at childhood adversity more generally, and by this I mean you can include things like abuse, traumatic events, living in wartime. All of these things are going to be big traumatic events that cause childhood adversity. And what we know, again, on the developing brain, is that the more childhood adversity, the larger and more hyperactive the amygdala is. The amygdala is also able to better inhibit inputs from the frontal cortex. So you remember one of the things that happens in, in an adolescence is that 
the adolescent brain starts to learn to control those impulses from like the amygdala by having the frontal cortex make more um, uh, projections down to cause it be in more control. But people who have more childhood adversity are not able to do this as well because the amygdala is able to resist that sort of inhibition from the frontal cortex. You also have more damage to the dopamine system, which means that um, you're gonna be more vulnerable to alcohol and drug addiction as a result of that childhood adversity, and also leads then to more adult depression. So this is all stuff that happens in childhood is still having then effects later on in the teens and adult years. Other general effects on brain development, and these are just a, a few other things that to consider. So these would include things like diet, um, and diet means lots of different things in terms of what nutrition is and so on. But you can even look at it from the simple thing of just the way in a, in a, in a particular day that you get sort of like energy spikes and energy crashes. A lot of modern diets now are, you know, kind of like um, take a lot of carbs right away when you first get up, get a quick breakfast, maybe eat some white bread, maybe um, get some juice in you or something. So you get a lot of sugar and a lot of um, glucose coming into the body quickly, creates a lot of energy, but then very quickly it gets used up because you're not using, um, you're not creating things with fiber and more substance that would actually last longer in terms of energy. And so because of that, you get these energy crashes, <laughs> sometimes 20 minutes to an hour later, all of a sudden you feel dead. You've got like a brain fog because you've had these energy spikes. And so what people then do is they drink coffee or they eat more snacks and they go back up again with their energy spikes and then they crash again. So you can imagine that kind of constant cycling of energy spikes, energy crashes is going to have effects then and how well you can focus and how well you can pay attention in school and uh, pay attention to your friends and things like that. So just the way that we kind of in this modern Western life eat a lot of junk food that causes a lot of sugar to go rushing through our bodies and then having energy crashes, that could be affecting our brain development. But also just having nutrition deficits, just generally speaking. Um, a lot of the processed kind of modern food that we eat right now is actually quite nutritionally poor. And so researchers like Pelser et al. in 2011 have shown that kids who are switched to a more healthy diet where they basically have to eat more plants, more um, you know, unprocessed food, actually do better on lots of different measures in terms of attention and behavior and social relationships. So nutrition is also going to have effect on brain development if you constantly have a bad diet. Um, another thing that has been found again and again is the effect of different kinds of food additives. And so, for example, McCann et al. in 2007, Bateman et al. in 2004 have demonstrated that different kinds of food additives that are given to, um, like in children's cereal and so on, these food additives can also have effects on brain development. In fact, in Europe, uh, uh, when that McCannerall study pu was published in 2007, many European countries banned the food additives that were identified in that article of having these negative effects. Um, but lots of other parts of the world, including like the United States, have never banned those food additives. So they're still having those kinds of effects on brain development. Now, moving away from diet, we could look at the effects of pollution. Um, air pollution is going to turn out to be a very serious problem in terms of the things, the particulates that are in the air. And depending where you live in a more urban environment, there could be more air pollution and therefore it's going to affect brain development. And I'll talk about that more in just a moment. But there's also all sorts of chemical pollutants that are out there. Um, like a big one for many, many decades has been lead. Um, lead was in our fuel, our petrol for many decades. So you might have noticed that if you go to fill up your car with petrol today, you, usually there's a big advertisement that says you have unleaded, right? There's not really anything leaded anymore. I don't think, I don't think legal leaded uh, fuel is legal in most parts of the world at this point. But um, They've always had unleaded fuel. It's interesting about this. Un unleaded petrol was around since the 1920s. Um, but what it was is that apparently by adding lead to the petrol, um, it changed the way that they processed the petrol um, to make it for your car. But there was like a patent associated with it. And so therefore, um, leaded fuel could be marketed by having a particular formula and then the oil companies can make money from the patent. And that's why they like for, persisted for many decades in fighting people from um, banning leaded fuel. But all that lead then was emitted in the air 
And so for many decades, people were actually consuming lead, um, breathing it, especially in areas where there are a lot of cars. And so thankfully, now we've switched to unleaded fuel. But there was also lead in paint and other, um, it was an additive used in lots of different places. And so now we know that lead is basically really bad for brain development. In fact, this article here that you see in 2007 shows how crime is actually related to how much um, lead was exposed into that um, preschooler's brain. So if before the age of five, you grew up in a place that had a lot of lead exposure, lead in the water, lead in the petrol, lead in paint, um, you were more likely then to have uh, crime in your life um, later on. So you had more antisocial behavior. And so obviously that's having some sort of effect on brain development as well. That thing about air pollution, though, I just wanted to end today's lecture by talking about this in a little bit more detail, looking at a focus on air pollution, because it's a real problem for brain development. Here's a, um, a report that was released um, just a few years ago by UNICEF, um, in which they looked at danger in the air, how air pollution can affect brain development in young children. And what they're trying to show you here in the pictures on the right, figures one and two, is just how common... Um, air pollution is in the world, even today, at uh, places where it's much higher than what should be recommended by the World Health Organization. And so you can see that all the different parts of the world where babies are born, you can see the number of babies in the millions living in these areas where air pollution exceeds those limits. And so these are all the areas where there's that. And so you can see a lot of babies are coming from East Asia, East and Southern Africa, uh, Latin America, um, South Asia, these are the big areas where you're getting a lot of um, exposure um, to air pollution. It's not so much in North America and Europe, um, but in the other parts of the world, it's pretty high. And then on figure number two, they looked at the worst affected areas, the ones that have the highest, where the limits are way in terms of the particulates are really, really high. And this would include a lot of South Asia, a lot of East Asia. Um, these are the main areas in the Pacific where you see a lot of these uh, uh, air pollution standards are just out of control. So again, air pollution is bad. And so what kind of effects does it have? Well, how does air pollution affect the developing brain? This is all in this report. Um, they say that particulate matter breaks down the blood brain barrier. So if you have a lot of particulates in your air, and particulates are basically all the little things that are floating around in the air that makes pollution, that stuff gets ingested into your body and therefore it'll start to break down your blood brain barrier. And you remember the blood brain barrier, as I talked about in a previous lecture, is really important because it helps keep pathogens out of getting into where the neurons are in your brain. And so if that, matter, if that barrier is being broken down, it's gonna be easier for you to have problems then. Um, some, small, some particles are actually small enough to enter your olfactory nerve in your gut, and they actually have magnetic charges that can really just mess everything up then about your nervous system because they're now in your body um, and just and they have magnetic charges and their magnetic charges actually affect the way your nervous system functions. You also get these things that are called PHA, PHA, PAHs, which come from fossil, fossil fuel combustion that cause a loss of or damage to the white matter in the brain. So again, even though we got the lead out of the petrol, being around all those cars that are emitting all sorts of other kinds of pollution out there, these PAHs, the PAHs can cause loss of or damage to the white matter in the brain. The bottom line for all this, as they say, is that preliminary studies are already showing associations between air pollution and IQ, memory, behavioral problems, including social behavioral problems, anxiety, and depression in children. And now the most latest research is showing that the air pollution can also affect the de developing fetus. So we talked about all that fetal neural development happening. And if the mother is living in a place where there's a lot of air pollution, that stuff gets into the developing fetus and affects the developing fetus's brain as well. So these are other considerations then to think about when we're looking at that vulnerable developing brain. So in sum, we've talked a lot about prenatal development, that developing fetus into birth and all the way up to year one. We've talked about five processes of the development of neurons, the roles of experience and environment, the vulnerable developing brain, which included stress and childhood poverty, stress and childhood adversity. We talked about diet and we've talked about pollution. So that's all I have. In the next lecture, we'll talk about sex and gender development. Yeah, I want to go.